Okay? So here are my disclosures, and all of these slides are in a PDF that uh, you could have gotten before you got here on the web. Some of you bought the little mini drives that we ha have out front. Some of you may even have a printed syllabus. Uh, it depends on how you like to learn. So here are my disclosures. And okay, going back one. Okay, here are the objectives. So to understand the epidemiology of hypertension and recent improvements in blood pressure control rates, to review proper blood pressure measurement <coughs> technique and the role of office, home, and 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure measurement, to review the sprint trial data and how it may influence future hypertension <coughs> guidelines dealing with blood pressure goals recommended to improve cardiovascular and renal outcomes, and to recognize which classes of antihypertensive agents are recommended as first-line agents in the treatment of hypertension. So first we have a polling question. Recent blood pressure control rates, that is the less than 140 over 90, in a national health care organization, it's Kaiser Permanente, has been as high as, please answer, 95%, 80%, 70%, 50%. Where you're unsure, and please answer unsure if you're unsure. literature, what's the systolic blood pressure target in your high-risk patients, 50 years of, more than 50 years of age, using an automated acylometric <coughs> blood pressure measurement? Less than 150, less than 140, less than 130, less than 120. Please answer now. Based on the most recent literature, what should be the target? Okay, the predominant answer is less than 130 and less than 140. We're neck and neck. Next question. According to JNCA, which of the following antihypertensive drug classes is not appropriate for initial use in an uncomplicated hypertensive patient? CCV, thiazide type diuretic, beta blocker, <coughs> ACE or R, none of the above. of hypertension and the recent improvements in blood pressure control rates. Um, <coughs> we're going to need to do something about this for some reason. I'd rather be able to control it and say next. the impact of hypertension is about one in three of us in this room, all being adults, that have hypertension or are being treated for hypertension. About 80 million have hypertension. Um, about two-thirds of people with a first heart attack, a little more than three-fourths with a first stroke, and three-fourths of those with heart failure have a blood pressure of greater than a 140 over greater than 90 or they are hypertensive. Contributes to between a quarter and a half million deaths per year in this country, and poor medication adherence is a major barrier to effective blood pressure control. Only about 57% of our patients remain adherent to their blood pressure medication at two years follow-up. So somehow, working with patients to make sure that they're taking their medications is imperative, and you would be surprised at how many patients tell you they're taking their medication and because there's not good feedback between the pharmacy and the office, and because we do medication reconciliation with a list from the patient and not the bottles of their last prescription, we're often not aware of the actual 
patients filling of their prescription and what they're actually taking. So we need to do, do a better job of being more vigilant to make sure we know everything over the counter, alternative, and by prescription that they're actually taking. Hypertension is associated with short overall life expectancy. Now when you look at awareness, treatment, and control rates from left to right, this is the most recent data that I could find published in circulation. You can see that most of our patients are aware of their having hypertension. The blacks are the most aware of their having hypertension. They are as likely to be treated for their hypertension in the middle column, but they are less likely to be controlled and Latinos, or Hispanics as defined, are the least likely to be aware, treated, and controlled. So we really need to work with these populations of patients extra vigilantly, although all patients need to be aware and treated and effectively controlled to a minimum goal currently of less than 140 over less than 90. And when you look at the success rates in the control of hypertension, this is um, top bar is Kaiser uh, Permanente, and you follow them from 2001, as published in JAMA, all the way up to 2009. You can see that their blood pressure control rates now is, are less than 140 over less than 90. That's how they define control. Now, how are they so successful? Okay, when you look at their ability to be successful in a more recent publication, you can see that regardless of the ethnicity or race or gender or age, across all ages, races, and sexes, hypertension control exceeded 80%. African Americans, about 81.4%, but all other groups above 80% to less than 140 over less than 90. Now, what allows them to do that? Although I am somewhat against a fixed algorithm, a cookbook, if you will, toward medication treatment. This works very well for them. You can see that their goal is less than 140 over less than 90, and they begin with a combination of an ACE inhibitor <coughs> thiazide diuretic, lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide. But as they up titrate this fixed dose combination agent as initial therapy, you can see that they go to BID HCTZ, and their ceiling dose actually ends up being 40, 50 of lisinopril and HCTC respectively. 50 milligrams twice a day, 25 BID. I know you all are using 25 once a day. HCTC has a short 12 hour half life, many hours of the day. Patients are not being covered with the effectiveness of, with, of a thiazide, which over the steady state has little to do with diuresis and has everything to do with peripheral vascular resistance reduction. So, 20-25 BID, if not at goal, excuse me, they then go to um, either, uh, and you can see if they're a, a pregnant or of childbearing age, and they're concerned about the RAS blocker, they'll go to either chlorothaladone or HCTZ, and up titrate to a higher dose, which is half the dose of HCTZ for chlorothaladone, which clearly is a 24-hour induration drug and has more evidence at 25 milligrams than HCTC has at 25 milligrams for stroke, MI, heart failure, kidney disease prevention. Then they go to a CCB. I like the peens. I prefer either amlodipine or nifedipine. Nephrologists like nifedipine. Non-nephrologists like amlodipine. And then if they're still not controlled, where we would consider them resistant, being on a thiazide, three drugs, not controlled, they would add, in my book, spironolactone, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, preferred, or a beta blocker. Why I get patients referred to me with resistant hypertension on a beta blocker, hydralazine, and clonidine is beside me. I, I can't understand it. So why not have the patient on a RAS blocker thiazide and CCB as the first three drugs. Now, what else allows Kaiser to do such a good job of controlling blood pressure? Well, their patients in a fixed healthcare capitated system where clinicians are just rewarded for doing good care, the patients do have access 
is a formula availability. They're using oscillometric automated devices, machines to take blood pressure. I know that seems, sounds antithetical, but they're reproducible. We use them in clinical trials. More frequent follow-up with in-house laboratory. A lot of our <coughs> patients go to a lab. It's not necessarily hooked up to our computer. We don't have the labs. We can't move on the labs. We can't call patients. They have the best electronic health record with evidence-based metrics. When your patient's not at goal, you get a little view alert. When your patient's not on a RAS blocker and they have CKD, you get a, a view alert, a little reminder, a clinical reminder. These things are to help the clinician relook at that patient in the panel <coughs> and see what's going on. In addition, Kaiser pays for performance. Clinicians that take the extra work which it takes to really get patients control, telephone calls, perhaps more frequent visits, they pay them for that performance, and they use nurse and pharmacist managed clinics, which are evidence-based to further improve blood pressure <coughs> control. So all of these things allow us to do a better job of controlling blood pressure, and in your practice, in your system, how many of these do you have access or opportunity <coughs> to use? Okay. Let's move on from the success that we can achieve and to look at how we're going to take blood pressure measurement in the future. And I just wanted to talk to you about office, and everything we do is based on office. Our government feels that the last office pressure is the last important pressure for the control of hypertension. That's a mistake. And we'll compare it to home and 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure measurement. The problem with office blood pressure measurement is that we, have, we get an insufficient number of readings. There's an inherent variability just sitting here. You all have a second-to-second -second change in your blood pressure of what we would detect if we were to measure it. So there's a variability of blood pressure, and variability is actually a poor prognostic sign. We'd rather see you always be at a particular blood pressure that variable blood pressure, and of course, we'd like it to be always controlled. In addition, whoever's measuring the blood pressure often uses a poor technique. So in the last year, and in fact, the day after we left this meeting last year, and many of you may remember, um, I was wrestling with severe left hip osteoarthritis. Well, that hip was replaced on December 22nd. The meeting was from the 19th to the 21st, and then I got my right hip replaced on August 5th. So it's been a real hip year for me in 2015-16. But I'm in a better place now, and I'm thankful to my orthopedic surgeon. But when I went for my one month and three month follow-up visit, and the nurse is putting on a cuff and talking to me about my pain score, and one to 10, I, I said, well, let me sit for five minutes. Please do not talk to me. Doctor, I have so much I have to do. I have to reconcile all your medicines, too. I said, well, and of course, she got a high value. And then I asked her to do it again. And I sat. And my systolic was 20 millimeters less, 126 over 82, instead of 148 or whatever it was. I came back for my three-month checkup. And she did the same thing again. And she remembered me. <laughs> I'm on the faculty of that place, but that's what they're doing. So <laughs> technique, technique. What are our staff doing? How did how the office set up? We'll talk about it. The white coat effect, it is true and it is real. And there are patients that get very anxious when they come into your office. And unless you have the opportunity, if you need it, to do a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor, you may be thinking that office pressure reflects all of their pressure. You may treat them, and they actually may get hypotensive or feel awful during the day because their pressures really are much lower during the day than they are in the office. So at a minimum, out-of-office blood pressure measurement is important for all patients. We'll talk about where we stand with 24-hour measurement. And then the mask effect. Now, this is a new category of patients we see in the office as being normal, but actually out of the office, they're high. And it's just a reduction to the mean and that one office value that doesn't allow them to realize they actually have hypertension. 
And unless, especially if they're close to 140, so let's say they're 138 over 86, and we say, oh, your blood pressure is fine, unless we have them sporadically measure their pressure out of the office, we wouldn't know if they're masked. And we're learning that these masked hypertensives often have CKD. They're more likely to be female and young, and they're more likely to be obese. So there are some parameters that we're learning about masked hypertension. That is, out of office, elevation, in office, normal. So here, the, the, the physician is talking to the patient for blood pressure technique. <clears throat> I'm going to take your blood pressure, so try to relax and not think about what a high reading might mean for your chances of living a long, healthy life. <laughs> What's, everything here is wrong, okay. He's talking. I don't even want to see the patient until their blood pressures have been taken. The column is on the wall that encourages sitting on the table. The state needs to be on the floor. She's startled. She's pushing off on the table. Her feet are elevated. All of these things are going to elevate her pressure. You're going to get a spuriously high reading, and you're off to the races. You're going to start treating her. She's pushing off on the table, increasing pressure, and she's, they're using too narrow a cuff, also increasing the pressure. So although I, I do like to take blood pressures, I don't take them anymore in the office unless it's an exit blood pressure in a patient that had it properly done in the office, as we'll talk about, on their way out, I will take my own blood pressure if necessary, but I still use an automated oscillometric blood pressure device. The aneroid sphygmomanometer is still acceptable. It does need to be calibrated every six months to every year. The machine actually needs to be checked also, but they're very, very reliable and they're very good just to give you a couple of companies, Omron, Welsh Allen, we use the Omron in every clinical trial that's been done for about the last 15 years. O-M, O-M, okay. Best way to take blood pressure. Preferably taken before the patient ever sees the clinician caring for the patient. My office where I see resistant hypertensive <coughs> referrals from folks like you all, I do not see the patient. I don't want them to see me, white coat or not. So they come in, they check in 15 <coughs> minutes before their appointment, and they will get their blood pressure taken in a room <coughs> by the nurse. How it happens, they're seated, you press a button, they have to be at rest for five minutes, and the nurse or office staff leaves the room. Then the machine automatically, after five minutes, takes three successive pressures, one minute apart, there's no conversation, no one in the room, unless they're schizophrenic and talking to themselves. They're seated comfortably with their feet on the floor, back supported in a chair, arm at heart level, no tobacco or caffeine for 30 minutes before the blood pressure. There's no one in the room. We take three seated pressures. The first one is almost always higher than the next two. Some people just take the second and third and average. In our clinical trials, we do average all three of the pressures using this automated oscillometric <coughs> blood pressure device. And then we come back into the room, the patient stands for one minute, but we press the button, they stand, and at one minute there's another pressure taken for orthostatic changes, blood pressure and pulse. That's the correct way to take the blood pressure. Now, what's controversial? Some people are saying maybe we shouldn't wait five minutes and we really want to have their pressure when they're rushing into the room, because that's what their life is like. Controversial. Most people want a standardized blood pressure measurement, but that is one area that we're going to debate for the new guideline. But I think you're going to see this kind of um, <coughs> verbiage on the new guideline in 2017. If you're truly hypertensive, your office pressure is greater than 140, and your home pressure systolic <coughs> is greater than 135. If you're truly normotensive, your office pressure is less than 140, and your home pressure is less than 135. Home being 5 over 5, lower for the definition of hypertension. Now, if you have white coat, your office pressure is high, and your home pressure, excuse me, your office pressure is high, and your home pressure is low. And if you have mask, your office pressure is normal, often high normal, and your home pressure is 
is high. So these are the four categories of hypertension conceptually that we need to think about. And this just defines it. This is how we define white coat and mass hypertension. You're going to learn a lot more about this new category, mass hypertension, in the future as we realize not only epidemiologically, but also from clinical trials, if we should be treating them, if their outcomes are improved, when we recognize them. So, we have office pressures. That's what we all base our judgments on. We have daytime out of the office pressure. We have 24-hour pressures if we had an ABPM. And we have nighttime pressures from an ABPM. We do not want our patients waking up in the middle of the night. If you look at a two-year follow-up for cardiovascular death and cardiovascular endpoints, if your pressure was around 150 in the cis-year trial when they did ABPM or very high, you'll see that office blood pressure is the least predictive. Then comes 24-hour, then comes daytime, and then comes nighttime. So the dipping what the nighttime pressure is, what the pressure is before they wake up during the day. They are all better predictors than the office, even though we base things on office blood pressure. Will that change in the future? It'll be so non-office systolic is a better predictor of cardiovascular events than office blood pressure, yet the government holds us to that office metric. You're only as good as your last office measurement. Now, when we summarize out-of-office blood pressure measurement, and I'm a huge believer, where it was my 38th year at the VA, although I retired in 2009, but we have been giving every veteran with an ICD-9 code of hypertension a home blood pressure measurement device since 1995. And we encourage them to check their pressures, and I'll show you how we do it. We don't want them to be a slave to their blood pressure, but to use the device effectively, efficiently. Out-of-office blood pressure measurement provides a better risk prediction than office-based monitoring. It correlates better with LBH and protein excretion in the urine than office-based readings, target organ disease. It clearly helps identify white coat and mask hypertension. The perfect storm is the patient's been seeing another <coughs> clinician, now moves to your area. You've heard of that clinician, and that's a good doctor. But that clinician has had this patient on two medications. You see the patient in the office with a high pressure, and you say, well, that is a good doctor, and now they're still uncontrolled on two medicines, and you had a third medicine. All along, that patient had white coat hypertension. If you look in the eye browns, you're not seeing much. You don't find protein in the urine. There's no LVH on an EKG. There's no renal dysfunction. There's no target organ disease. Yet the pressure in your office that day is high. And you add another medicine. And I, I don't have time to go into it this year, but we see about 50% of patients with resistant hypertension who have apparent resistant hypertension. In fact, they are resistant because the measurement is bad. The um, white coat effect is underappreciated. It's unrecognized. And they're not taking their medicines. So unless you do a 24-hour monitor when you give them the medicines you think they're taking, you can't find all these things. And you keep adding a medicine. But all along, there's been no target disease, and they have suffered from one of these reasons for apparent treatment resistant hypertension. So we like out of office to help identify white coat and mass hypertension. We like a 24 hour monitor even better. We like multiple readings throughout the day. If a patient checks their pressure at home, they're more likely to be adherent to their blood pressure medication and they're more likely to be controlled. Just by having that home unit, it reduces costs, and here's how we do it. We, let, we want them to take their pressures one week of every month. So if they're going to see you in a month, one, one week of readings, they pick the week. Three months, three weeks of readings. 
They take them twice in the morning and whenever they want. I encourage them to take them first thing when they first are getting up before they actually stand. And another time and then twice in the afternoon or evening. And then they take four readings every day. That's 28 readings. And we throw out the first reading. Some people throw out the first three days of the week. And we average the others and we look at those. That has been looked at as a reflection of the month's blood pressure. And yet, you don't have to have them slaves to the blood pressure. How many of us have had patients go to the emergency room at 2 in the morning when they feel well, and their blood pressure is 190 over 110? And the question is, why do you need to take your pressure? Their bladder was full. They haven't been sleeping. They're in pain from a tooth that's been bothering them, they haven't cared. A lot of reasons. Yet they show up in the emergency room and they're not urgent or emergent, they just have a high pressure. So we like out of office measures. You're going to find this surprising. The United States Public Service Task Force, last year, almost two years now, in all adults 18 and over, are recommending office blood pressure as a screening test for hypertension, but 24-hour ABPM as a confirmatory test before you start treating them. A lot of other groups do this. How many of you have ABPM available to you in your communities? Just by a show of hands. Okay, some of you do. How many of you have ever ordered a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor? I, I don't see that often when I get to talk to folks. And it's a great tool. It's a great tool. It's very helpful in our care of the patient. So they're recommending home blood pressure when you can't get ABPM, but confirming office blood pressure with something. ABPM preferred. In 2015, that's what our group recommended. And this is a level A. Recommendation, the highest. The Canadians have been recommending it for many years, ABPM. The Brits in 2011, before a diagnosis of hypertension is made, that citizen in England, United Kingdom, whatever we call them now with the Brits in, they will have a 24-hour ABPM. Yes. And the European society since 2013 has been recommending 24-hour ABPM. I like ABPM. You will too. And it's people like myself and societies that I'm involved in that need to push the payers <laughs> to get us this tool. We will not get wealthy by this tool, but we will gain so much information on our patients and the pattern of their pressure and when best to give them their medications. It is a very instructive aid to treating patients with hypertension. <laughs> We get multiple readings over the course of 24 hours. It's superior to office blood pressure in predicting heart, cardiovascular, <coughs> cerebrovascular outcomes, and it's considered to be the non-invasive gold standard. When you look at a 24-hour period, the awake average should be less than 135 over 85. The nighttime should dip to 120 over 70, which it often hopefully does. And the 24-hour average is 130 over 80. Those are the standards we use. And we get a nice printout, as you can see here. And we, we, this says 140. We actually use 135. So the slide actually was just brought up a little high. But you get, during the awake period, you'd like to be less than equal to 135 or 85. And the sleep, less than equal to 120 or 70. And awake again. So you get a nice 24-hour period every 15 minutes while they're awake. 30 minutes while they're asleep, and they do not wake up. And, uh, the holder-like monitor is very quiet, and it gives you very good information, and they keep a diary in case they get agitated or anxious. They tell you, at 2 o'clock, I got very anxious. I was in an argument with my boss. And yes, you look at their pressure at that time, and it may spike. It's very instructive. We like to see at least 40 measurements throughout the 24-hour period. We look at the mean overall, the awake, the sleep, the percent that dip while they're sleeping, and below the percent of blood pressures that are above the normal threshold 
at that time of the day. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the new blood pressure goals. How many of you are familiar with the SPRINT trial? Some of you, okay. This will clearly be included in the um, new guideline. Okay. I can't say enough about lifestyle modification. And when you look at every patient you would ever consider for drug therapy, I'd like you to consider lifestyle modification. Can you all hear me in the back? Yeah? Is the mic working? I guess it is okay. In the order of importance here, probably weight reduction has the greatest contribution to blood pressure reduction of all the lifestyle modifications. A low sodium, low fat, high protein vegetable um, diet, high in fruits and vegetables. So today when you were out there, I know we're gonna be short on fruits tomorrow, but that was the way to go if you have hypertension. The strawberries, the, the blueberries, the blackberries, you know, um, because it's rich in fruits, we didn't have any vegetables. Um, certainly we had low fat stuff out there and we had reduced fats. That can also lower pressure, sodium. There are, there's a big controversy going on right now. Should we, be restricting, so, should we be restricting sodium for all in our population? Controversial. I say in hypertensives that have chronic kidney disease, are obese, are African American, are elderly, are diabetic, five groups, I'd like to restrict sodium. And anybody with resistant hypertension restricts sodium. Any of us with normal renal function, perhaps we can use the salt shaker. But clearly in groups that are uncontrolled, and especially those five groups, a restricted sodium intake is important to further control blood pressure. Aerobic activity independent of weight loss and alcohol, just a little alcohol. So five ounces of wine, one beer, one ounce of heavy liquor is okay in the hypertensive. The problem is our patients drink more than they tell us and more than they should. But alcohol is cardioprotective, cardioprotective even in those with hypertension. So those are the lifestyles. Now, this is JNC7. There were two goals here, less than 140 over less than 90, less than 130 over less than 80. This was from what, 2003? Yep. Out of date. Then we had JNC8. It's referred to as JNC8, although it really wasn't endorsed as the previous Joint National Committees were, but it was an evidence-based document. And it suggested in 2014, oh, I lost something here, Randy. So I need to get back into the program. Uh, if you can get me out of here. Okay, so it had two goals. And these are not uh, in vogue. In 60 year of age and older, less than 150 over less than 90, and everybody else less than 140 over less than 90. That was the most recent recommendation. There was no less than 130 over less than 80 because that really wasn't evidence-based. That was opinion. And this document clearly tried to look at clinical trials and be evidence-based. This is a summary slide, an important slide that I put together based on the Brits, the Europeans, the American Society, and the International Society, the Canadian, which is updated every year, and the JNC8. The definition of hypertension is standard. The threshold for drugs, a little different, not much to focus on. Using beta blockers as first-line drugs, not a lot of evidence, mostly comparing atenolol, which is the devil's doing. How many of you are using a tenolol once a day in your practice? That's good. Oh, oh, ah, e. Ooh. We, we, we only want to use it twice a day if we're using it. And gosh, it, it's, it's just an ineffective comparator. If you ever want to look good, I call it the double date drug. If you ever want to look good, go on a double date, a blind double date with a tenolol. Because both of the young ladies are going to look at you because atenolol is just not a good drug. 
So if you're going to use it, use it BID. It has a short half-life, like hydrochlorothiazide. And you can see that although the Europeans do recommend it as an initial drug, the Brits don't, we don't, JNC8 didn't, and the Canadians only recommend it in younger patients. It's not a good drug in the elderly because their sympathetic tone often is not the culprit for their blood pressure. How many of you love chlorothalidone but just are afraid to use it? Ooh. How many of you use it? How many of you, that, that's awesome. How many of you are using HCTZ, which is still a good drug, especially, yeah, because we're, we, we're creatures of habit and we've grown up with it. Um, it's interesting that some groups are actually recommending either chlorothalidone or endapamide, um, and others just recommend a thiazide, thiazide-like diuretic. I do want to show you the Canadians, I'm going to embellish this in another second, the Canadians are recommending now in high-risk people 50 years of age based on Sprint, their target blood pressure is less than 120. Less than 120. That's not ready for prime time, but that's what they're doing just north of here in Toronto and all places across the country. So here's the SPRINT trial. I was involved in this. We ended up with 9,361 patients. They all had to have at least a systolic of 130 to 180. They, have, they were at high risk and they were not diabetics because we looked at the diabetics in the ACCORD trial. Our goal, double blind randomized. All of you all were double blindly randomized to less than 120 and you all were rec uh, randomized to less than 140. As an investigator, I knew what you were randomized to. You knew what you were randomized to. We got you to the goal, and we followed you, and followed you for hard clinical endpoints. The primary endpoint was MI, other acute coronary syndrome without an MI, stroke, heart failure, or death from cardiovascular causes. And if you were on, if you had a blood pressure as high as 180, you could be on up to one medication. But if you were 130 to 150, you could be on up to four medications. But the day of randomization, we stopped all medicines. We got your pressure less than 120, less than 140, and we, we treated you. Um, we, we randomized people that were at high risk. 20% had subclinical or clinical cardiovascular disease. They had had a stroke. They had claudication. They had an ABI of less than 9, 0.9, excuse me. They had um, a heart attack in the past. They had bypass. They had an angioplasty. They had clinical or subclinical disease with many risk factors. They had CKD, a GFR of 20 to 59. Framingham risk score, 10 year, was at greater than or equal to 15% or they were elderly. We wanted to know if lower blood pressure was harmful in the oldest of the old, if you'll allow me, 75 and older. We did not look at stroke. Uh, we didn't put people with stroke in the trial or diabetics or heart failure, clinical, heavy clinical proteinuria, really advanced CKD because we didn't want to deal with people that were going to end up on dialysis, polycystic kidney disease, or anyone by chart or by history who had had adherence problems in the past. We used the automated oscillometric blood pressure device. How did we take the pressure in the trial? Just like I told you. We saw them every month for the first three months and every three months thereafter. So right away, the results I'm going to tell you may not be as luxurious as you're able to afford, as busy as you are, as big as your panel is. So if the payers are going to hold us to these lower blood pressures, if, they need to give you the opportunity to see patients in follow-up, to get their labs so you know what's happening with their renal function and their potassium, like we did in Sprint. And if you were to take pressure in a haphazard way, not like we did in the trial, the pressure of 121.5 would end up being about 127. Some people would say 131. And it's around 130. So some people are saying, eh, don't hold clinicians to this. This is the right way to do it, but they don't have time for this. Their office can't be set up like this. So let them be sloppy, and we'll just keep them at less than 140. That's one camp that's out there. The other camp is, let's use this data the way it was replicated, because that's the most accurate measurement. When you look at the drugs that were used, we just use more of the same drugs in the intensive group, less than 120. 
There were no special medicines used, although clothalidone was preferred in both drugs, amlodipine was preferred in both groups, I should say, and spironolactone was encouraged if you needed a fourth drug. So that's said here, clothalidone was encouraged, amlodipine was encouraged, but all drugs were used. It was open in what drug could be used. All drugs were supplied to all patients. One, -fifth, one sixth of the patients were veterans. Everyone else was in clinical practices throughout, North, throughout our country, no Canadians involved. At the end of one year, starting at a blood pressure of 139 systolic in both groups on average, the mean in the standard group was 136, the mean in the intensive group was 121. It took one more medication to get to 121 than it did to 136. So they required about three medicines as opposed to two. The trial was stopped early because the Data Monitoring Safety Board kept seeing that one group was doing better than the other and they felt it unethical to continue. They didn't know which group it was, but the, the, um, um, the plots showed that one group was having significantly fewer events than the other group. And of course, here was the primary outcome. And the primary hypothesis was that the event rates would be lower in the lower blood pressure arm. They also looked, we looked at total mortality, progression of kidney disease, new onset dementia, cognitive impairment, and a subset of patients by MRI. And I need to tell you that this is one group of data, one group of data we haven't published yet. We do not know the results. So when I show you that the lower blood pressure is better than the higher blood pressure, we don't know if that travels with cognitive impairment. Because you wouldn't want to live longer with less cognitive ability, would you? No. So we don't know that. So this is a big unanswered question that we will know the answer to hopefully soon. Now when you look at the, um, the, the plots, um, you can see that it's highly statistically significant. Lower was better than standard, and the number needed to treat for the primary endpoint is very favorable. 61 patients needed to be treated to prevent a primary endpoint. By the forest plot, you can see that everything goes to the left, and most of it is statistically significant. It did not matter if you had CKD underlying. <coughs> if you were young or older, in fact, the older you can see do much better, so there's no harm, regardless of age, in, in encouraging a lower pressure. Gender didn't matter, but there were fewer women, so it was harder to show a benefit. The trend is there. African American, trend is there. It's all a numbers game, but it's going in the right direction prior or no prior cardiovascular disease, and look at the blood pressures. The lower the blood pressure on entry, the more likely you were to benefit. But everybody benefited, including the oldest of the old, and here's death. So what could be worse than death? And if you look at all-cause death, lower is better. So this is why the Canadians in 2016 have adapted in these high-risk patients, in the four special groups that are looked at. If your patient's a sprint-like patient, and about 16% of all patients in this country are sprint-like patients, this less than 120 achieved 121 by the methods we use looks better. What about the serious adverse events? Well, it's statistically significant that if you are in the intensive group, you will have more clinical hypotension, but it's only one per 100. 99 out of 100 people did not have hypotension if they were in the intensive group. Yet, it's statistically, you have to ask if it's clinically relevant. The same with acute kidney injury. And here's an important clinical pearl. If you have normal renal function and you precipitously lower blood pressure, be aware of the patient developing an elevation in their BUN and creatinine. On the other hand, if your patient has chronic kidney disease, the kidney is already autoregulated, and lowering blood pressure more precipitously will not harm the kidney, which can reset its blood flow somewhat. So you won't see the big swings in BUN and creatinine. It's the healthy kidney that doesn't like hemodynamic change suddenly, okay? 
So that's what we saw in the sprint trial, and uh, that's what we saw here. In addition, you have to monitor electrolytes. Remember, some of these people were on spironolactone as well as uh, chlorothaladone, and you can get into a hyponatremic problem. You also have to look at potassium. And of interest, the standard group was more likely to be orthostatic than the intensive group. That's an interesting observation. So if you can practice in a situation where patients have access, where you can see them every month for the first three months, where you can act on their electrolytes and get their chemistries and work with them closely in a population that will take their medications, we now for the first time have shown in high-risk hypertensives, lower appears to be better. So the implications, it will change the guidelines. What it will go to is unclear. I personally think it's going to be less than 130 in these high-risk patients, otherwise less than 140. How should blood pressure be checked in the office? I think the new guideline next summer is going to recommend automated office blood pressure. I think it will. Um, what do you do in patients that have a blood pressure less than 130? Probably leave them alone. They weren't studied in SPRINT. They're doing well. What about other high-risk populations? I think the diabetic is going to continue to be at less than 140 over less than 90. The ADA two days ago just came out with their new updated 2017 guideline, and they're sticking with less than 140 over less than 90 in the diabetic. Post-stroke, less than 140 over less than 90. Um, by the way, the Framingham risk score in all, the, all of these sprint patients was 20% mean in both groups. So it's a very high risk group, even though you could get in at 15% FRS if you didn't have the other risk factors. What do you do with people less than 50? What do you do with people who are not at high risk? I think 140, less than 140, or the sweet spot, is 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. If you got all your patients between 130 and 139 and 80 and 89, you're doing a tremendous job to control their overall risk. But one size does not fit all. Here's what the Canadians said, and I'll just, they're, they're recommending AOBP. They use a device called BP True. It's developed by a Canadian, and it's a device that takes six blood pressures separated by a minute apart. But look at this. In adults, right from the manuscript, 2016, in adults 50 years of age and older, using ambulatory office blood pressure, if the systolic is greater than or equal to 130, in selected high-risk patients, intensive management to achieve a target systolic less than 120 is recommended. That is a game changer, and that's what they're recommending in Canada. I'm not sure we're going to recommend that. I think it's going to be a little higher. When you review all of the different trials, you can see there's a little bit of controversy here, okay? But the bottom line to me is most people are going to be less than 140, 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. Some are going to be less than 130, 125 to 129 like Sprint patients using AOBP. Diabetics, still less than 140 over less than 90. And then finally, what are the agents that should be the first agents? If you're thinking of using, in no particular order, a thiazide, thiazide type, an ACE or an ARB, but not both, and a calcium channel blocker, in our opinion, the cl your clinician is doing a very good job. These drugs work tremendously well together. They block the RAS system. There's so over, some overlap to block the sympathetic system. They get rid of volume. They vasodilate. They work on all the pathophysiologic mechanisms. After lifestyle, if you're African American, we recommend it in JNC7, a diuretic or a CCB as the first drug. So those of you that think an ACE or an ARB should always be the first drug, think again. 
Think again even in the type 2 diabetic, because I know the ADA recommends it, but in the all-hat trial, in 14,000 diabetics, 15,000 diabetics, we couldn't show that lisinopril was better than clothalidone. So there's no real evidence, unless they have chronic kidney disease, that a RAS blocker should be the first drug. But if they're African American, because they're so sensitive to the volume component of hypertension, a thiazide diuretic and a calcium channel blocker, one of the peens preferred, should be the first drug. Second drug, RAS blocker. At the end of the day, most of us end, on, end up on a RAS blocker and a thiazide or a RAS blocker and a CCB. Beta blockers should be included as an initial drug when there's a compelling indication. Post-MI within two years. So Mr. Jones had an MI 10 years ago and is still on metoprolol. We no longer recommend you necessarily continue it. So if they weren't controlled, you might consider one of these three drugs. You might even consider stopping a medication, even though I know that's very difficult and most clinicians just continue to write the metoprolol. But beta blockers, post-MI for two years, and heart failure with reduced EF. That's where the beta blockers rise to the front. AFib, control the rate, beta blocker, no problem. Thyroid disease, control the heart rate, beta blocker with hypertension, no problem. But not as an initial drug in most patients with hypertension. So the available evidence does not support the use of beta blockers as a first-line therapy in the treatment of hypertension. And that's from um, the Cochrane database. So let's summarize, take some questions. We understand now better the epidemiology of hypertension, and you can see how in the right system you can really do a great job with the right algorithm of controlling blood pressure. We talked about the proper role of taking blood pressure. We summarized the current clinical guidelines that guide lifestyle, very important, and pharmacologic treatment of hypertension. And then we talked about the first three classes of agents recommended unless there's a compelling indication for another 